Cardiomyopathy is a broad term used to describe a variety of issues that result from disease of the myocardium. When cardiomyopathy develops as a way to compensate for some other underlying disease, like hypertension or valve diseases, it's called secondary cardiomyopathy. But when it develops all by itself, it's called primary cardiomyopathy. Now there are three main types of cardiomyopathy. The most common type is dilated cardiomyopathy. That's where all four chambers of the heart dilate or get bigger, and the heart walls become thin and lose contractility. Next up is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that's where the walls get thick, heavy, and hypercontractile. Finally, there's restrictive cardiomyopathy, which is where the heart muscle is restricted, meaning it becomes stiff and less compliant, and that prevents the heart from filling properly. The muscles and size of the ventricles, though, stay about the same size and only get slightly enlarged. Restrictive cardiomyopathy may be idiopathic, or secondary, to a disorder that either deposits harmful substances, like iron or amyloid, into the heart tissue, or there's fibrosis caused by immune cells or radiation. In all three types of cardiomyopathy, over time the heart may be unable to do its job effectively, leading to heart failure signs and symptoms like fatigue, dyspnea, and swelling of the feet. Individuals may also develop acute symptoms like presyncope or syncope, which is a sudden loss of consciousness, usually lasting a few seconds. These individuals are at an increased risk of myocardial infarction, and because cardiomyopathies affect the cardiac muscle as well as the pacemaker cells that run through the cardiac muscle, they can lead to arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, ventricular ectopic beats, ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation, and atrioventricular block. On auscultation, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy causes a crescendo-decrescendo murmur between S1 and S2, so during systole, where it gets louder as blood first rushes out and then softer. On the other hand, dilated and restrictive cardiomyopathies cause an S3 heart sound on auscultation, which is the result of blood rushing and slamming into the dilated ventricular wall during diastole. Then comes ECG which is usually abnormal in a variety of ways because there's significant remodeling of the cardiac muscle in all of the cardiomyopathies. Common findings include atrial fibrillation, ST and T wave abnormalities, premature atrial and ventricular beats, atrioventricular block, and intraventricular conduction delays. Identification of the cardiomyopathy type relies primarily upon echocardiographic evaluation which makes it possible to measure the thickness of the wall, dimensions of the cavities, and the pericardial space, as well as the left ventricular function expressed by ejection fraction. In dilated cardiomyopathy, the echocardiogram generally shows left ventricle dilation with an end diastolic dimension higher than 112% of the predicted value after correcting for age and body surface area. Additionally, individuals have a normal or decreased wall thickness and ejection fraction below 45%. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is characterized by increased ventricular wall thickness, or mass, and the left ventricular volume may be normal or reduced. The normal cardiac wall thickness for women is up to 11 mm, and for men is up to 12 mm. Between 12 and 15 mm, there's a gray area, which isn't classified as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy unless a family member is affected as well. But any individual with a cardiac wall thickness over 15 mm is diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Finally, in restrictive cardiomyopathy, the heart's shape tends to be normal, so it's characterized by non-dilated ventricles with impaired ventricular filling, but generally there's a normal ejection fraction, so between 55 and 70 percent. Hypertrophy is typically absent, although infiltrative and storage diseases may cause an increase in left ventricular wall thickness. Sometimes imaging with an x-ray can be helpful for diagnosing cardiomyopathy, showing an enlarged heart in dilated cardiomyopathy, a normal to enlarged heart in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or a normal heart shape in restrictive cardiomyopathy. In some cases, especially in restrictive cardiomyopathy, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, or computed tomography, is done to look for deposits of fat, iron, or amyloid, as well as evidence of inflammation or long-standing fibrosis. This can help identify conditions like amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, and hemochromatosis. Finally, in some individuals with restrictive cardiomyopathy, 
an endomyocardial biopsy can be done to look for deposits in the myocardium. All three types of cardiomyopathies can run in families. So if this is suspected, ECG and echocardiography can be done to screen the immediate family. That's particularly important since many cases of sudden death are found on autopsies to be due to an undiagnosed cardiomyopathy. In fact, this is particularly relevant for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is the most common cause of sudden death in young competitive athletes, and pre-participation screening programs that include an ECG and echocardiography are often used to avoid these tragic fatalities. Based on screening, if family members have evidence of a cardiomyopathy, then genetic testing is performed. Cardiomyopathies that have a genetic component often have a low penetrance, which means there are many individuals that have genetic markers consistent with cardiomyopathy, but never develop the disease. For these reasons, individuals who are offered genetic testing should also receive genetic counseling to fully interpret their results. There is no cure for cardiomyopathies other than a heart transplant, so the goal of treatment is aimed at symptom relief and ensuring that the heart continues to function as well as possible to avoid a myocardial infarction and development of congestive heart failure. This may include treating the associated disorders such as arrhythmias with medications like beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, or heart failure with medications like beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, as well as diuretics for individuals that develop fluid overload and congestive symptoms. Additionally, individuals that have a left ventricular ejection fraction below 35% or have recurrent ventricular tachycardia or malignant arrhythmias may need implanted pacemakers, defibrillators for those prone to fatal heart rhythms, or ablation for recurring dysrhythmias that cannot be eliminated by medication or mechanical cardioversion. In some cases, patients might be treated with cardiac resynchronization therapy pacemakers, or CRT pacemakers for short. A CRT pacemaker delivers tiny amounts of electrical energy to the heart through tiny wires or leads embedded in the cardiac muscle. This helps restore the normal timing of the heartbeats, causing both ventricles to contract and pump together more efficiently, and that improves cardiac output. Alternatively, the final option in end-stage situations where other forms of treatment have failed, patients might have a heart transplant or implantation of an artificial heart called left ventricular assist device, or LVAD which takes blood from the left ventricle and pumps it through the aorta. This could be permanent or temporary for patients waiting for a heart transplant. All right, as a quick recap, there are three main types of cardiomyopathy, dilated, hypertrophic, and restrictive. Diagnosis relies primarily on echocardiographic evaluation, which makes it possible to measure the thickness of the wall, the dimensions of the cavities in the pericardial space, as well as the left ventricular function expressed by the ejection fraction. There is no cure for cardiomyopathies, so treatment is based on treating the associated disorders and might involve medications like beta blockers or calcium channel blockers for arrhythmias, or beta blockers and ACE inhibitors for heart failure, as well as diuretics for those with fluid overload. Some individuals get implanted pacemakers, defibrillators, or ablation. In some cases, patients might be treated with cardiac resynchronization therapy or CRT pacemakers. Finally, some individuals need a heart transplant or implantation of an artificial heart called left ventricular assist device or LVAD.